premillennialism did not die. In the first decades of the 19th century, restorationist groups sprouted from the Second Great Awakening. These groups professed decidedly premillennial beliefs in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Most noted of these restorationist groups were Alexander Campbell and the Disciples of Christ, and Joseph Smith and the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. In the 1830s and 40s, a new voice was heard that espoused premillennial beliefs, and that voice was William Miller. William Miller is an interesting dichotomy. Initially, he was born and raised Baptist, but rejected this belief in favor of deism and Freemasonry in his youth. The War of 1812 changed everything for William Miller, who was a captain in the regular army of the United States. He saw his first action at the Battle of Plattsburgh. According to Miller, he should have died in the battle but miraculously survived by the hand of divine providence. After the war, Miller was deeply concerned with questions about life and death. Driven by his fear of death, Miller returned to his Baptist roots and soon had an encounter with Jesus Christ. During the initial years after his conversion, Miller was obsessed with Bible study and end-time prophecy. During his studies, Miller concluded that the millennial concept taught by Charles Finney was not sound biblically. William Miller was convinced by his study in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 that the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to in this verse represented the earth being purified by fire during the second coming of Jesus Christ. Miller used a modified form of the cosmic week day-year principle of the early church. He taught that one prophetic day equals one calendar year to interpret these prophetic days as years. Miller set the beginning of this prophecy at 457 BC by using the dating method taught by Archbishop James Usher, a 17th century theologian. He then concluded that the end of 2300 prophetic days would fall in 1843. Miller said, I was thus brought to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. In 1831, Miller began to share his secret with family and friends, and soon he was asked to present his views at a local church. Soon his notoriety increased and the crowds grew. In 1838, Miller published his work entitled, Evidence from Scripture and History of the Second Coming of Christ. Joshua V. Himes, pastor of the Caradon Street Baptist Chapel in Boston, joined with William Miller and took his message to the streets with the biggest tent in the county. These tent meetings transformed the message of Miller into the Millerite movement. Massive crowds came to his tent meetings, and in six months, Miller preached over 300 sermons. This new doctrine so angered Charles Finney that he organized a face-to-face -face meeting with William Miller in order to set him straight on his interpretation about the book of Daniel. Finney saw William Miller and the Millerite movement as wild and irrational, but the movement continued to grow. The numbers grew and eventually over 50,000 people believed Miller 
and his interpretation of Daniel. As 1843 drew near, the people demanded that Miller set a date. Therefore, he announced that the final year would be from March 21st of 1843 to March 21st of 1844. As the year progressed, tension mounted with people in a near panic. But the appointed day came and went with nothing happening. Miller saw the disappointment in the people. He confessed his error and reset his date at October 22nd of 1844. Many Millerites withdrew from their churches and sought to get their affairs in order. They sold their property, closed their stores, quit their jobs, and abandoned their farms and animals in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. When this date came and went, most of Miller's followers were completely disillusioned and embittered toward Miller. William Miller died in 1849, a discredited and forgotten man. This event became known as the Great Disappointment in American church history, and it has similarities with the millennium hysteria witnessed by Hippolytus of Rome in the latter second century. One small splinter group would not accept the disappointment and believed that Miller was right. This group was led by James and Ellen Gould White, and today we know this group as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Miller's great disappointment only breathed new life back into the post-millennial vision for America that was optimistic about its future. But post-millennial America was on a collision course with social and political change it could not avoid. And these changes were the social secularization of society and massive non-Protestant immigration. Post-millennialism was not the answer. A new theory would come to American shores from England called dispensationalism, preached by John Nelson Darby. This new doctrine would displace post-millennialism in the early 20th century. What can we learn about millennium fever from these tumultuous centuries? The early reformationist theologians spent more time chasing Antichrist than seeking Jesus Christ. John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards stepped away from Antichrist chasing to refocus their thought and energy on seeking the face of Jesus. And guess what happened? Revival broke out. We must never lose sight of the fact that true Christian eschatology is about Jesus, not the Antichrist. You might think that there is no need to make such an obvious statement, but this is not the case. Take the time to review much of the end time prophecy material being published today, and you will see that Antichrist chasing is back in vogue. Where is Jesus in all our apocalyptic rhetoric? We read about the beast and 666, and the revival of the old Roman Empire in a ten-nation confederacy of Europe ruled by the Antichrist. We spend more time watching the Trilateral Commission and the New World Order of the Bilderbergers than watching the church for true spiritual revival. Presidents Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and Barack Obama have all been linked to the Antichrist by Christian conspiracy theorists. Again, we are losing sight of Jesus chasing the Antichrist. Give some thought to this question. 
Are you watching for the coming of Antichrist more than seeking the face of Jesus Christ? How you honestly answer this question will diagnose your susceptibility to Millennium Fever.